Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're delighted to see you uh, and to be with you today. I'm Robert Putzman. I'm the director of the Masters of Bioethics program here at Columbia. And we're thrilled to have a very special guest today, who is Liz Blackmer, uh, for our Ethics for Lunch series. Those of you who are here in person get a free lunch. Those of you who are uh, joining us remotely, welcome. Uh, and uh, we see this is a very interactive session. So please feel free to ask questions. If you're in the room, just raise your hand. If you're uh, online, please feel free to use the chat and uh, you'll be very much a part of the conversation as well. Liz is a wonderful senior ethics consultant at Sloan Kettering, where she's been for 16 years. She trained here at Columbia and at uh, uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And I've had the privilege of working with her as part of the Empire State uh, uh, by Reckless Consortium, and it's with great pleasure that uh, we welcome her here to Columbia to speak. Thank you so much, Liz. Great. Thank you so much. Um, it's actually great to be here. I, My first job out of grad school was at the Center for Liver Disease and Transplantation, so the, the neighborhood is familiar yet totally different, and so it's super nice to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk about ethical issues related to fertility preservation in oncology care. And let's see. So we know that cancer treatment can damage um, re reproductive organs. So chemotherapy, immunotherapies, targeted therapies, radiation can cause uh, great damage and result in infertility. So it goes without saying that in my world, the world of oncology, we have welcomed um, fertility preservation into our, in, you know, in, embraced it, if you will, but it's not without ethical dilemmas. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, I want to give you a very brief and high level overview of the fertility preservation technology. This is as per the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO. So that's my um, professional organization, if you will. So Thanks to advances in and innovations in the field of fertility, cancer patients, adult patients, can proactively extract and preserve their sperm and eggs um, prior to participating in any sort of tumor-directed therapy. Um, we've also had great innovations in ovarian tissue cryopreservation and retransplantation, and also ovarian transposition. This is where we um, we remove or relocate temporarily ovarian um, ovaries and fallopian tubes to, out of the, the, the site of radiation, if you will, out of the radiation field. And then finally, embryo cryopreservation is the gold standard. It is the, the accepted practice for patients to participate in prior to starting chemotherapy. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the recent current events and the uncertain legal ramifications of embryo cryopreservation that are sort of brewing around the country. And certainly just pause to say that as providers and as ethicists, we no doubt need to be a part of these discussions supporting patients, families, and staff. So we'll see what happens with that. So although there have been several uh, published guidelines for in our pediatrics, adolescents, and transgender patient populations, our prepubital options are quite limited. And so for our young, young patients, young girls, ovarian tissue cryopreservation is the only option available, but um, outcomes from that are, are quite diverse. Uh, to date, only there's only been one live birth from cryopreservation uh, O ovarian tissue cryopreservation and transplantation. To give you a frame of reference, in our adult population, one in four cryopreservations results in a live birth. So we still have a lot of work to do for our young girls. And for our young boys, it's, it's the same. Immature testicular tissue cryopreservation is the only option and it is still experimental. So now that you know everything you need to know about fertility preservation and oncology, let's, um, I want to, I'm going to move into some cases. So this is designed, as Dr. Klitzman said, to be interactive case discussion. I'm told you are a lively bunch and this won't be a problem. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, in preparation for this talk, I looked at the Sloan Kettering's database of about 1,400 ethics consultations, looking for different, unique, interesting fertility preservation cases. And I came up with two that will hopefully pique your interest and we'll start a good discussion. The first one will be a prepubescent um, ovarian tissue cryo 
cryopreservation case. And the second is an adult sperm cryopreservation case. So um, I'll start and give you a little bit of information and then I'm hoping to have a dialogue about this. So the first case is about an eight-year-old girl with a neuroblastoma. She is status post multiple chemotherapies with an alkylating agent. So this is high risk for impaired fertility at an outside hospital. So she came to us transferred for a neurosurgery. We know that she lives with her parents and her siblings in Long Island, that she's Orthodox Jewish, and that while her parents are supportive and actively involved in all aspects of her care, they do defer big medical decisions to their community rabbi. And so everybody's sort of working together with the rabbi. And as an ethics consultant, I'm called by the primary team because the rabbi is requesting ovarian tissue cryopreservation or OTC. And this is against the recommendations of the fertility preservation group. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the case. So we know that the rabbi and the parents, their primary goal is to preserve and increase chances for future fertility. Their hope is that it will help increase marriage opportunities. And they've read new, um, new information and research about OTC, and they want to try something. It's important for them to try something, the goal of trying to preserve a future opportunity for fertility. We also know that the fertility preservation group, they, they feel like this is, it's a moot point, that she's already received the bulk of her chemotherapy. It's unlikely that the OTC will work, the ovaries are already damaged. Um, and then they also cite the data that I just gave you, that it's, there's a low and limited chance at baseline for a success in pre girls. And so, um, and then a little bit more information comes out. The nursing staff is quite upset. They're frustrated. They think that um, her prognosis is guarded, that she's likely not to um, live long enough to try to have children. And so that why are we putting her through this? Um, and the staff is also upset that they, because she wasn't referred to for fertility earlier in her journey before she came to our hospital. So what do we do? Who wants to start? Floor is open. Floor is open. Good. Is there any sense that the parents want to use this tissue even if she doesn't survive? Good question, right? Some, right? No, of course, right? So there have been some instances, and we've certainly had instances at, the, at the, my institution where patients and or families have been trying to preserve tissue for future use by somebody else after the, after the patient has died. So that's certainly something to think about. And I think the questions that come up is who owns this tissue um, now and if the patient dies. So just one thing, mm -hmm. your questions are online and difficult to hear live audience can speak to repeat the question. So just repeat the question. Yes. Or if you, you're in the audience, you give me the mic. Yes. So the, the question was, is there any concern that the family might have ulterior motives and want to um, keep the ovarian tissue um, after the patient dies? And so that was the question. Lots of people. You can go back and forth between, uh, just tell them to go back in the room and online. We're going to go back and forth with questions in room and online. So be patient. Dr. Klitzman is monitoring the chat. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, can you, um, as the about discomfort and procedure, um, to look at the should, should, should please persuade the medical team to go forward? Fantastic. So this is exactly what, what I'm thinking as a consultant. What are the, what's the risks and benefits of this procedure? For this patient, it would be general anesthesia and like a unilateral oophorectomy. So they would go in and remove one of the ovaries. Um, and so not without risk. Um, the other note I would say is that it should not significantly delay neurosurgery. Um, just by a few days or so, because you don't have to, you can't stimulate, stimulate the ovaries beforehand. Right. Yeah. There's a question online. Uh, what is the patient's understanding of the situation and does she have any thoughts about this process? Patient is eight years old and it seems to be giving assent to different uh, blood draws and things of that nature. The team has not tried to talk to her about her fertility preservation and the options available. 
So question is, do you think we ought to? Good afternoon. I have two questions. Well, the first pertaining to this is, to what extent is therapy, therapy um, being afforded to the child afterwards? Um, and then my second question are, what, I guess, processes are being put in place to avoid instances similar to that of like Henrietta Lacks situation? When you say, when you say therapy, do you mean uh, cancer therapy or psych psychological therapy? Oh. Both. Okay. So she, this patient's coming to our institution right at the end of her chemotherapy. So she's being prepped for, for uh, neurosurgery. It's unclear what her post-op um, adjuvant treatment will be if she'll re if she'll need more uh, tumor directed therapy or not. It depends on um, whether she has a recurrence or not. And then two, I like your question about the emotional support. And so certainly at the at my institution and most you know major cancer hospitals, there is a robust uh, social work and psychiatry, psychology, and child life program that will be there with her throughout her journey to help her process what's been happening. And we also have a really big survivorship program um, that works with, with teens and young adults post-treatment. So yes, good questions. So here, uh, Richard C. was uh, questions. Uh, how do you reconcile low chance of success versus no chance? And we ask, why not give the family some hope if the burden is not too severe to the child? Perhaps she is one million. And that's, that is, that's a great um, thought. That's exactly what the family and the rabbi are saying. We know that it, the chances might be slim, but it, something is better than nothing. Let us have hope. And then also remember this piece about marriage um, uh, having, it, it looks better for marriage prospects, right? To at least they've attempted to try to preserve her fertility. And so this is a big piece of the question that's come up. This idea of is the are the risks do the risks really outweigh benefits, and who's the benefit for the patient or the family or both? Um, if in the very small chance that she does survive for a few more years, very very small chance, um, would there be any negative consequences of doing the? cryopreservation because she's essentially lost one ovary and also should this even be something to consider if the chance is so small that she'll survive so this is you're on to something here thank you for this so part of what the fertility preservation group is saying is that what they know from research is that when young children undergo chemotherapy post-op or post-treatment one year that's when they can really test to see whether fertility has lost or it's been preserved. And so there's actually a pretty, a decent chance that one year post-treatment, they would, um, you know, her fertility, her ovaries might have actually recovered. And so the concern is if we do an a unilateral oophorectomy, then she's only got one ovary left. And what if that ovary recovers? And so that's a piece of what they're trying to balance. And, you know, um, I say this all the time, and I'm sure you've heard it, but I think medicine is an art, not a science. And so it's really easy to lean on data, but it's much, there's a gray line there and it's, it's hard to know what to do when. And so this was a piece of what the fertility group was struggling with is that they've seen other children in similar situations recover their ovary function. And so do we, do we limit that by removing one of the ovaries? So a lot of great questions coming out and said keep them coming. Uh, is the cost of treatment being covered at all by insurance or privately being paid for? Um, the family has resources in the community and they are unconcerned with the, the financial repercussion, financial like, uh, you know, th their cost that comes from not only ovarian tissue uh, cryopreservation, but then the storage for long term. So that's typically something that's not covered in all by all insurance companies. It's it's and it's based on carriers. So, so a few questions that will go around. Yeah. Um, it is very hard to imagine an age appropriate way to explain the situation to an eight year old, and even harder to imagine her having capacity, actual or legal, to make a truly informed decision here. So the question is: is consent 
to any procedure or foregoing any procedure possible for this eight year old. I guess assent is really the issue they're talking about. So I want to comment on that. Right. So while we don't look for consent from a patient, so she, this patient, because she's eight years old, it's you know, she likely understands pieces of what's happening. We would look for assent. So we look for her to go along willingly with with the procedures. So um, we wouldn't want to force her to do something that she was adamantly opposed to. With that said, you know, I think that there are ways to have these conversations in age appropriate language with children, with the help of her parents and her community to talk about um, talk about this. Um, with that said, I think it's hard for for adults to understand the nuances of this. And so we do the best we can, but we look for assent always. Here's one more than people maybe have you going in the room. Uh, are there concerns about development and genetic heritability of neuroblastoma? What does the patient want? Does the patient want to preserve her fertility? There's other questions here. Who is the ultimate decision? I would suspect the patient in this case. So I guess it's the genetic heritability. Is that an issue? So this is a question that we have to think about whenever moving forward with some sort of tissue preservation for fertility. And the question really is, is are the remnant cancer cells that can be reintroduced with autografting? So when we move, if when we retransplant the tissue back, um, is there a chance it could carry cancer? And so that's something that we don't have enough, we don't know all, enough about, but it's something we're thinking about. Yeah. Barbara? Just one more quick question. Sorry. Um, What's the, you said there was one live birth from this procedure. And do you have any idea what the denominator is there out of how many attempts? Just to give like, I guess the family and us an idea. And then also, is there a sense that this will improve with already frozen material or it requires different freezing techniques? Right, so this is something that we're thinking about. Um, first, first question, I don't know the denominator, but it's low because we, we, they're not, people are not, um, we, we don't have many, um, it, it hasn't happened very often. And so it's sort of a new technology. So we don't have, I don't know what the denominator is. The second piece is, um, will, will future technology, um, as it improves, we'll be able to use the same tissue. It's, there's a chance later. So as things improve, there's a chance it could improve later. I, there's a few other questions. Do you want to go on or what do you think? No, we've got, this is just where I want it to be. So you, another couple, two more questions. Maybe. Okay. Is ovarian tissue, this is following on Barbara's question a little bit, is ovarian tissue cryopreservation in pediatrics still considered experimental given the lack of live births in the population? If still experimental, should this be offered under clinical trial? I know ASRM, the American Society for Reproductive mm -hmm. Medicine, has removed the experimental label largely based on adult data do we have enough data to say this is not experimental in children slash pre-pubertal patients with ovaries? It is still considered experimental and it would require an IRB approval or override to, to proceed. So that's that's where we're going with this. So there's multi-layered. It's an option, but it's we don't have enough information. We haven't done enough um, research on it to know whether how effective it is. Okay, uh, why don't you go on for the moment because some of these okay. overlap a little bit with prior questions. We'll come back if we have more time. Okay. So here are some questions. And I, I actually, I think what's so impressive is that a majority of these questions you guys asked, right? So um, big questions when we're thinking about is, you know, what's overall prognosis, which was a question from the back of the room that I didn't answer. So should we not do something like fertility preservation, because we're concerned this patient may not survive to adulthood. Is that a reason not to do uh, uh, OTC? Just some nods, yes or no? People are. And people online feel free to comment. <laughs> no, I'm getting a lot of no's. No. Right. It's a factor. It's a factor, exactly. Lot that, so there are someone said from the audience said it's a factor. Exactly. So it's something that we think about, but it's not all or nothing, right? Um, what's the likelihood of success? It seems like today success is low, but the future is uncertain. Like what, what is the what will the future technology and innovation allow us to do? And do, should we preserve this opportunity for this young girl later? Um, does it delay the start of treatment? You know, 
again, this is uh, she's right getting queued up for neuro uh, for neurosurgery, and we can delay uh, you know a couple of days a week for neurosurgery, and that did not seem to be an issue. Um, are the risks of complications? I think the biggest complication, the biggest worry that the team has is about removing doing an oophorectomy, removing one of the ovaries. And did we just reduce her chance from having a natural birth later? Because there is some there are some studies that show that ovaries can sort of um, regenerate, sort of the, the damage is less less prevalent later, a year or two after treatment. So that's that's a big concern. Um, do the parents and guardians have good understanding of the efficacy and the risk? I think they do. I think their eye is on the prize and they're really focused on wanting to preserve future opportunities. And then again, back to this question of consent versus assent, does the child understand what's happening? This is much harder This for this specific girl that she was um, uh, not actively participating in most of the decision-making, but a uh, uh, sort of go, willingly going along with things. So it's unclear, you know, for eight years old, it's, it's hard to understand how much she understands of what's going on. So um, I can now tell you what happened. Do you guys want, what do you think happened? Anybody want to take a guess? Oh. I, I think the fact that this needs to go to the IRB because it is experimental is is perfect because to me this should resolve revolve around the the, the science the, the science involved it really is a purely risk benefit analysis and given you know, sharing with us that there is some risk of eliminating the possibility of recovery and it was, it's really a, a very fine line about what is best for this child and I think the scientific minds need to completely inform the IRB on whether or not this should be based upon the best scientific information. You'd think I'd planted you in the audience, but I thank you for that because in the end, this is what happened from ethics. As that consultant, we met and had lots of discussions with the team trying to understand the science. So I'm not a fertility expert, but I had to learn how to understand enough of it to navigate what was happening. Um, and also spent a lot of time understanding the patient and the rabbi's um, approach to this and you know their goals, their, what, what, was, what was driving this. And we facilitated two family and team meetings talking about what was happening. At the end of the day, ethics supported the fertility preservations group's decision not to not to go not to move forward with OTC for a couple of reasons. But really and with discussion with the IRB on the side too, was this something the IRB was going to approve? Because the science didn't back it was one reason, but that wasn't it alone. It was also because there's a chance the ovaries can require re recover one year post um, chemo. And so there was real concern about removing one of her ovaries and what if, you know, it would reduce her chance of possibly, um, you know, uh, becoming pregnant later. And so, you know, as with some ethics cases, they're unsatisfying. So these this parent these parents and rabbi were not happy with the decision with our, with, with what we had decided to do, but did thank us for having these thoughtful, comprehensive discussions, and they requested to transfer care, and to to try to facilitate the OTC somewhere else. That did not end up happening, right? And they ended up getting neurosurgery with us. Um, and this young girl is still alive, and this was a couple of years ago. Wow. So. Um. Three years ago. Yeah. Barbara? That's interesting. Oh, sorry. It's interesting thinking about what's best. And then I'm thinking about Dominic Wilkinson is an ethicist in Oxford who's with the Charlie Gard case thinking about a harm threshold instead. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it as a harm threshold, like what the parents are requesting and how harmful it might be, it the decision might have gone the other way, do you think? That the harm did not really rise to the level of preventing this from happening? I think, I agree. I think it's ethically permissible to both proceed and not proceed. And you could make an argument on both sides. And so in this case, I think the science sort of 
slightly won out just a smidge over um, the needs of the family and the hope for for a future. Um, it could have gone, I think any good case, you don't know what the answer is going to be, the outcome, and it could really have gone in a different direction. Mm -hmm. But it was really the force and the drive of the different parties involved. The IRB had had a lot to say about that. Um, and then also fertility and, and the different um, pediatric teams. It's a great presentation. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Barbara. Well, Dominic Wilkinson would say, in the Charlie Gard case, the parent, the government wanted to withdraw care from an infant with a severe, uh, I believe it was a mitochondrial disease, and the parents objected. And his ideas was that perhaps, and, and so this argument becomes, how far should parental rights go? Um, and instead of saying what's best for a child, which can be different depending on your mm -hmm. the glasses you're wearing, mm -hmm. maybe we should say, well, parental rights go as far as they're not doing harm at a certain threshold. And so he, you know, in his in his paper, he establishes a threshold, but any society would have to establish what that threshold is. For us in this society, we certainly say that if a intervention make or a lack of intervention make kill a child, like a lack of, if you don't do a blood transfusion when it's indicated that that's beyond the threshold and that the state will take over. And so just the question here was, I guess, really, where is our, what, are, what might our harm threshold be? And does, is the harm involved here really there? And I think this sort of really does enter that gray zone. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets a little bit into, as they, they wanted to leave, right? Parental rights and where do those, parent, what are the contours of those parental rights? No, exactly. Anyway, sorry, that was Bob asking me to say that. No, thank you. I appreciate your help. <laughs> um, if, I think there was one question back here, and then we'll move to the next case. I just wonder if instead of one live birth from this type of cryopreserved tissue, if there were whatever, eight, and it had just gone to just barely the other side so that you didn't have to consult the IRB, do you think that the overall decision would have gone the other way, that the IRB was sort of where it where that decision happened? It's quite possible, right? Having more experience and a few more live births under our belt, if you will, would have um, would have shifted things a little bit. Yeah, it's quite possible. It's a good good question. So here's one other question online. Was it fair to say that the science lead all to believe the parents' goal, fertility, was best preserved and achieved by not doing the procedure? The, uh, this is reference to she's now 11. Yes, I, I mean, I think in this case, you could make an argument that the science actually did preserve her, her perhaps ability to have a future child, and that that was over the objection of the parents and rabbi in real time. Yeah, but it could have it could have very well gone the other way as well. So it's these are these are tough cases, and there are no easy answers. Okay. And I think I was worried nobody was going to say anything. So this makes me, I was so happy. Um, so our next case is a 23-year-old man. He's newly diagnosed with testicular cancer. He comes to see us in clinic and it's pretty aggressive. And the team wants to move forward quickly with chemotherapy, followed by radiation and surgery. And this is for curative intent. He is severely autistic, nonverbal, and largely unable to follow commands. Um, he does not have decisional capacity to participate in any of the medical decision making. And just a side note, there's no guardianship paper paperwork on file, which is often what we see. His parents are very supportive and involved attending all of his their appointments, his appointments together. They are divorced. Um, but seem, you know, as far as we can tell, are very, very supportive of him. He lives with his mom, but stays with his dad every other weekend. Um, he does, he requires full-time care, and it's really a combination of private pay, um, home, home health aids through Medicaid, and also um, his parents. So um, the consult was called by the primary team because the parents disagreed about whether to proceed with fertility preservation. So... We know that the oncologist has recommended chemotherapy that causes permanent damage to the testes. So it's now or never, right? We're gonna either cryopreserve sperm now or we're, or we're not. Um, uh, it was discussed and the, the two options for fertility preservation for this, this um, patient is through masturbation or surgical, surgical retrieval um, with cryopreservation. 
And the thing that's complicating it is mom and dad, right? So mom is emphatic, dismissive of the whole process. He cannot be a father. This is not an option for him. End of story. I don't want to talk about it. The father says, wait, this is my son should have the same rights as all 23 year olds. What the, he, we have to do this for him. He's a man. We have to do this for him. So what do we do? The good ones are tough. Someone said it was a tough one. So the question I would ask is, what is the genetic information on the transfer of autism, for example? Like, you know, like, uh, it's uh, necessarily true, but I, I would... That was not a question that, that had come up. Um, and so that did not seem to be an issue for fertility preservation, the primary team. And it actually wasn't a question the family was asking. How does dad see fatherhood for his son? People are having trouble hearing this one. So that's, that's a big piece of this. So dad wants his son to have all of the same opportunities and the rights that he has, that he's, so he values his relationship with his son. It was one of the best things that happened in his life is having this son. And he wants to make sure that if something shifts and change and his son is able to have children later, that he have that opportunity. It's about agency for him. Um, this idea of, of just having the right to do something that he did. I'd like to know whether the father has any specific practical vision of how these sperm would get used with his son's participation or without his son's participation. So as we start to talk to the father a bit more about what his concerns are, it becomes clear that this is part of a bigger argument that he's, that the, he's had with his ex-wife uh, on um, parenting, on um, uh, rights and sort of access, having his son be as normal as possible and that this is normal. And so while um, they didn't outwardly talk about use of this tissue, you know, separate from the son, um, this is something that the mother did question. So it was... There was some complicated dynamics, and this it tended to came to a head with this one decision. And I think, thinking back on it, it was really based on lots of decisions that perhaps the father had had not had a voice in over time. Remember, the patient lived with the father only part time, you know, every other weekend, and that mom really was the primary person making all of the day to day decisions, and dad didn't didn't love that. So there's a. Uh... Few questions about um, the main one repeats something you said earlier. Prognosis for child regarding his cognitive abilities. Uh, has he ever said you know, what's his understanding of his reproductive future? So prognosis was good. If you talk to the the, the urologist involved, it was curative intent. So the goal of expedited chemotherapy. So that's a, a key for you, expedited chemotherapy. We needed to start soon with surgery and radiation was a, was curative intent. That was the goal. Um, from a cognitive function standpoint, this patient had gone through some, some specialized school training, but now was at home, was not able to hold a job, um, was not able, or e even do any volunteer work. He was not participating in, in activities of daily living. Um, in the same way as others. So, no, hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> For the people on Zoom, because they can't. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think kind of related to some of the earlier questions that just came out of the chat was, I know you expressed that he was nonverbal, but does he have other abilities or has shown other abilities of communicating with his parents, with the team, um, just if, if he's at all kind of been involved in these conversations or has it really become his parents on behalf of him and the team? So he is present for the, some of these discussions and he likes to draw. So he is expressing himself through art. And so he's, he's often doodling or drawing pictures. Um, 
he is not, he's nonverbal. So he's not, he's not using, he's not talking, but I think he's, you can tell when he's upset. You can tell when he's okay. He is, he has been giving assent with mom and dad coaxing him to do things like get scans and get blood work. So he's a willing participant as much as we can tell. We've not had to, um, you know, he's, he's not um, erratic or harmful to himself or others. He's, when he's in pain, he's sort of, you can tell he sort of closes in and isn't, doesn't participate as much, but it's unclear how much he, he's listening, understands what's happening. So we really are looking to his parents to help make decisions on his behalf. So a few questions here. Uh, was there any psychosocial support offered? And then was there any involvement of OPWDD, which I think is the office, office of support. mental health? Yeah. So the parents were encouraged to do, go to through our caregiver support. Uh, we have a caregiver support uh, entity at the hospital. And so there were opportunities for them. They needed to do some sort of um, couples counseling, if you will, to, on how to, how to best work together to take care of their son. And so that was, that was suggested and the social worker was working with the parents to try to help um, them come together to make decisions for their son. Um, the Office of Mental Health and Disabilities was not involved. Um, we often, so this patient did not have a guardian and we, um, this was a piece of what needed to happen is that we were counseling the, the family about how to set up advanced directives and decision-making for him in the event that they were not able to be there and make decisions. And so that was sort of happening in tandem. But back to this whole idea of expedited chemotherapy. So all of this is happening. I don't get called when things are going well. I get called when we need it. We need something quick. Um, and although in ethics, we try to slow things down. In this case, I had an oncologist who was pressuring and wanting to start chemotherapy as soon as possible and felt he couldn't do that because we, we had this big dispute between the parents. Um, you mentioned that the mother didn't want um, cryopreservation because she like she thinks he can't be a father, but why exactly? Is it because of the genetic component? Like she doesn't want to have autistic grandchildren or is it because she doesn't think that he'll just ever find a use? For the sperm. So I'm, I'm, my guess, and this is not something that she was able to verbalize, is that she felt she was already providing total care for him, that she was unsure how he could actually um, uh, produce a child and then who was going to take care of this child. Like she, it's like she discounted his ability to have a companion or a partner. Um, and that it just felt like it was just very dismissive of it. Um, perhaps a bit of caregiver fatigue was happening. So uh, one way I think you just answered was about the uh, um, who would take care of a future child if there were one. And then um, what are the potential concerns given that the patient may not be able to communicate or participate in therapy after the procedure occurs? In, in what kind of therapy? In uh, I assume, well, I, um, ongoing treatment, and I guess this relates part of the ability to raise a child. Right. So this was this was a part of the dad's, uh, the mother's concern was that there wasn't, you know, we're helping him get through treatment. We, we, you know, we want the very best for him, but it's hard to even imagine him having the responsibility for somebody else. It just didn't, it hurt. It just didn't make sense. Um, I just got some questions back here. I have a guess that she might think it would become her responsibility since she's already mostly responsible for him. And, you know, it is somewhat easier for the less involved parent to think, oh, well, this, you know, could be lovely, who knows, maybe some woman will help her get pregnant with his sperm and whatever. And the mother is thinking like, they're all going to become my responsibility while he's seeing this more as like a metaphor almost about who his son is. But I think there's also like this other question of like who owns these sperm, right? Because he doesn't have a guardian and he would he be the legal owner of the sperm? It seems clear he couldn't give like written consent for the IVF process. So then like could the father independently own the sperm and arrange things so that there is now a grandchild without the mother even being involved in that? This seems really uh, a lot of rabbit holes to go down. It's a lifetime movie in the making, right? So 
Absolutely. I think there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of, um, and the whole piece of who owns the sperm is interesting, right? And just sort of think about not feeling comfortable that we could get consent um, from the patient and then what, who, what happens after. Yeah. Any more? I saw you have a question right there. Uh, oh. I, I have a question. Who so who owns the sperm, right? So if this was an adult with capacity, most um, uh, paperwork in place, sort of you, you identify who, you know, what happens to the sperm post-mortem and do you give permission to give this to somebody else, like to your spouse or not? So it's very clear. And sometimes it's the, the, the um, artifact is disposed of and sometimes it's not. And it's very clear in, in the documents. And so, um, yes, in this case, we, weren't, we would not be able to do that. Um, has the patient ever expressed the desire in one way or another to have children? I love that. So he has a brother who has a child and he likes to hold the child. And if he sits somewhere, then he can sit and hold his, his um, niece a niece or nephew, I can't remember. And so there is some connection there. And so this is a piece of what dad says. So I like that you brought that up. It's not totally foreign for this patient. The father seems maybe not to understand that his son would not be able to take care of a child. So how does the father respond to these concerns? He, he's blinded by this fury of not having a, a say in what's happening. So this is bigger than his son. It's about this complicated relationship with, with his, his, his ex-wife. And so there's that. He, can, he can't hold for long that his son will, can't, can't, would, might not be able to provide the nurturing care that one needs um, growing up. And so blinded by this relationship. Um, all right, I'm going to do this. So the ethical question for this is how do we balance the rights of a severely developmentally disabled patient with those of his two parents who disagree about the best course of action? And so we were really, we were under the under fire because we, we were being pressured to help support the parents in making a decision in an expedited fashion, somewhat expedited. I mean, I think working in oncology long enough, every, you know, the oncologist always want to start chemotherapy right away. And so um, there was some pressure that was not unfounded to continue to, to move forward with a decision one way or the other so that they could start the chemotherapy. Um, you know, we know that all patients have rights regardless of their cognitive status or other things. We also know that, you know, all patients have, have the right to access to standard of care. I would argue that's fertility preservation and tumor-directed therapy. And so we were trying to both offer the, the fertility preservation and make sure that we could expedite chemotherapy as soon as possible. Um, this question of agency came up quite a bit. And while you know assent is necessary, there was real concern that this patient was not, could not understand the enormity of a decision like fertility preservation. And so how do you how do you move forward? With, how do you justify something like this? And it, it, are there, you know, how, how do you do that? And there's no, I don't have a clear answer for you. And then the, the family dynamics really just the screaming and yelling in the hallways. It was, it was a complicated situation. You have a question, Barbara. I, I'm, not sure. I'm not sure where this question is going, but it just makes me think, let's say the patient did, was not developmentally disabled. But said because what's well, something so so interesting that that most patients have a right to a certain set of treatments, and so he should have access. That makes a lot of sense, and that rings quite true in our ethical frameworks, mm -hmm. right? So, what do you do when someone refuses, uh, or does that happen often? Fertility preservation, how like a young a twenty three year old man who says, "I don't want anything saved." All the time. So, all the time. And so, and that and that doesn't trouble us that they're giving up that opportunity. I'm, a, I'm an autonomist, if you will. So I believe in informed consent. I believe we have an obligation uh, are required. We are required to provide patients with the information they need to make decisions. And then you, they have, you know, and go that extra effort. I've been called in. Um, I can think of more than one case where we've been called in to sort of help support and to help make sure all the information was given. At the end of the day, um, if you are an adult and you have decisional capacity, it is your decision. And so I, I stand by that. I, I can think of cases with uh, homeopathic medications where, where young adults have wanted to forego, um, you know, Western therapies, a curative, with curative intent for 
you know, IV, you know, uh, vitamin C. And so it happens. It doesn't feel good, but the job is informed consent and to really avail patients of all the supports they need, trying to help not change their minds, but help them understand the risks, the consequences of their decisions. And that's great, which also makes me think that we just have to give him whatever his substitute autonomy is then. And that's what I guess we feel we're missing. So that's why what we commented, what we said was that if in, we were up against the gun, remember, so if we could not find some sort of resolution, some mediation, it was not unreasonable to preserve the opportunity for a future um, choice. And so, because there came a point where we couldn't keep talking about it because people were at a standstill. And so without being able to move that needle, we we, we supported a decision, an attempt at retrieval of sperm. But the decision, the recommendation was not to do surgical uh, but not to do surgery um, to extract it because that was going to take a little bit more time and, um, you know, high risk, higher risk. Mm -hmm. And so instead we would, we would attempt to do it the old fashioned way, if you will. And so um, the mom agreed to it. She wasn't, she understood why we were doing this because we were really moving forward with the bigger picture was how do we get this patient to treatment sooner? And so um, there was an elaborate plan that involved the patient's brother who came to the hospital and they tried. They tried a couple of times and wasn't able to do that. And so we were not able to retrieve sperm, but dad felt like we tried. Mom understood that it was important to preserve a future option because we didn't have any more time to, to spend with the mediation. It was time to move forward. And been, I think it'd been two weeks. We waited two weeks as we're moving through this. And so um, that's how the case ended. Thoughts, questions? Scientifically uh, supported uh, uh, information that this young girl is going to be to understand the ways of decision about this going to that was not something that was being considered, no. I, mean, I understand the low risk bit in the investigation, but it seems like it was a, a preserving something that he was not able to understand or give consent, and he was an adult. So um, it wasn't like his life was in danger without it. It seemed I'm just a little bit surprised that given his inability to understand and consent, given his age and given the purpose of this, that ethics can be actually recommended in investigation. Would it have been different if he we had had formal guardianship paperwork through the Office of Mental Health and Disabilities? To my mind, it seems like the kind of thing that you're not capable of. of society or for their grandparents. This is an individual decision and responsibility in, in my mind. I'm going to push back. I'm going to challenge you because I think who is who, who? Oh. I don't know if there's actually a, a, a question. I'm just expressing um, that in this particular case, given the mental capacity of this individual, is that he's in to understand or serve any type of a fatherly role. If there is no legitimate expectation that that will improve. That, that's the big scientific question. If there's a chance that there may be some breakthrough in autism, and perhaps by the time he's 30, he may all of a sudden be a, a, a more capable person, I would feel much differently. So I'm going to repeat the question because I think there's uh, some audience is having trouble hearing it. So uh, let me ask it this way. Should a diagnosis of autism and in and, and sort of a... Um, who decides what a parent, what the qualities and traits of a parent should be? And does this patient meet those, the, this, this prescribed ideal about what a father might be? 
because of his autism diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I'm pushing back on that because you know, so, so another one is like, you know, he's a very like if there's someone that was going to, to to have this child with him and this father's really was literally going to be just to love and show some physical affection, that may be so, so that's fair. That's that's very fair. That's very good pushback. We've had we had another case recently of an of a married couple, both autistic, moderate to severe autism, who wanted who who wanted to have children together, and the community that they lived in had had things in place to take care of this. Well, that's but, fine. So, the, but to me, they wanted that, right? They understood and they wanted it. In this case, we're dealing with a young man who didn't understand or express any desire for this. But to the fact that at some point he can better understand and, and maybe just serve some limited way if he was a partner. So I mean, I mean, it's it's fair. It's I, I mean, I, I I'm giving that perspective. I feel a little bit more comfortable. With it. Thanks. It's decision. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Klitzman. So there's a few questions online. Uh, one is, uh, what if the masturbation was successful? Decision making over the story simply would you expect the same level of disagreement on the points? And the other is, what would you have done if I was opposed to the plan? So we had sidebarred our legal counsel who fully supported this idea of preserving a future opportunity while not delaying chemo treatment any longer. And so the discussion that the discussion with them with with legal was really would we help how would we help draft um, a contract because this you know we don't we don't we don't preserve and keep sperm you know, at the hospital, it gets sent out. And so part of that is making sure that there was a good contract in place that would give equal rights to both mom and dad. Um, if mom had not, if mom had not um, uh, been accepting of this of this attempt at sperm um, crowd preservation, what would we have done? I don't know. I mean, I think we would have worked really hard with her to try to move past this decision and towards the next decision, which is that this is for a greater good. The whole idea is really to get him to treatment. Um, sidebar, you know, he, I, when I checked his MRN, he is still alive and he's cancer free. And so we, we push to get the treatment and I don't like to push through consults. I feel like what we do best is slowing things down sometimes, but in this case, it'd been two weeks of discussions and it became very clear that we were not going to mediate a resolution between the parents. And so we had to sort of step in and offer a suggestion. And I think... <sighs> My my sense is that both parents were relieved, certainly dad, but mom almost was relieved that it wasn't her decision anymore. And that we had we had we had offered a recommendation that she just sort of went with. Um, but still unsettling. Another question. Oh, good. It's just a comment, and I wondered what you thought. I do sometimes think that these cases around reproductive material are sometimes about something else. Um, it, the last case as well, sometimes hopes and aspirations are placed on this material that's really either may not be helpful or not even mm -hmm. that special or whatever, but the, there's something almost magical about them for families and, and there's something else going on. So I just thought maybe if you wanted to reflect on that. It's, you know, it's, it's a sign of normalcy, right? For both of these cases, this, this future option of fertility, of fertility, of having, um, being a parent, of having a child and going through all of those normative experiences was so important for both the father in the second case and the parents and rabbi in the first case. There was something about that. And then in the, in the midst of chaos, you know, cancer diagnosis and treatment, uncertain prognosis and your child, whether they're 23 or eight, it's, it's palpable. And so I think we're often having, and certainly in, in my, my setting in Canton at Sloan Kettering, we're having to dig through that piece of the, the enormity of the weight of the cancer um, and get to some of the, the issues underneath that. And so that's, it's really important. Um, but also the other piece I'll add is that 
um, the parents in the second case, they got divorced um, a couple of years after their 23-year-old was born because they were not able to um, collaborate on parenting because they had different ideas about how to best parent this autistic son. And so um, there was some deep-rooted history there. So, you know, there's cancer. There's also complicated di family dynamics that really came to head for this case. Um, and we, we thankfully have um, a psychosocial team that's, you know, very robust and involved in these cases to both help address um, the issues that come up for patients and caregivers along the way. So um, I think we're out of time. We're out of time. Thanks, you guys. I have... So thank you, Liz, for a great presentation. Thank you all for joining us here in the room and also to everyone online for your questions. And just a reminder, we have some other wonderful events coming up on March 28th. Who should pay the ransom when hospitals get hit with ransomware? This is actually an article on the front page of the New York Times yesterday, uh, March 28th. Uh, psilocybin versus the law, ethics, and society, April 18th and information sessions about our master's program, March 20th and April 17th. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Yeah.